oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, le gouvernement libéral a confirmé que l'inflation a atteint un sommet de 10 ans au Canada à cause de dépenses sans contrôle de ce gouvernement. Tous les coûts de la vie augmentent. Logement, éducation, transport et épicerie. Les Canadiens ne peuvent plus accepter des dépenses sans limite de ce gouvernement. Quand est-ce que les libéraux vont... When will the Liberals stop spending out of control? The Honourable, the Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. The traduction, I hear. OK, on va voir si on peut le corriger. OK, we'll see if we can correct the problem. Now, did everyone hear that or was this that just this one member? I just want to double check. Can you hear me in English now? French. OK, so it's, it's working. Uh, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition to repeat his question so that everyone... The Honourable Chef... The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, he, if he can just repeat the, the question for everyone's benefit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will repeat it because this is an important issue. The Liberal government has confirmed that inflation has hit a 10-year high in Canada because of their out-of-control spending. The cost of all kinds of things is increasing. Housing, education, transport and groceries. Canadians can no longer accept this reckless spending from this government. When will the Liberals stop this reckless spen spending? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what the biggest threat to Canada's economic recovery today is, partisan games from the Conservatives. The Conservatives' tactics are preventing us from getting the budget passed. And this irresponsible behaviour is threatening the well-being of all Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Inflation is at a 10-year high. The cost of housing is up nearly 40 per cent. This is quickly turning into an economic crisis for Canada's working poor and families trying to buy their first home. The working poor and first-time home buyers can't afford more of the same economic incompetence. Can the government guarantee that housing prices will stabilize and start going down by the end of this summer? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what poses the single greatest threat to Canada's economic recovery today. Conservative partisan gains. Canadians need the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy and income support to be extended to the end of September. Our government wants to do that. But conservative partisan delaying tactics are stopping us from passing the budget. And that irresponsible behaviour threatens the well-being of every single Canadian. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what is irresponsible is that Canada is the only country in the world that had no budget for two years, Mr. Speaker. And they, when it comes to the housing crisis, this government is telling Canadians, don't buy a house, just rent. That minister and an out-of-touch, ideological Liberal government is telling Canadians to give up on the dream of home ownership. Instead of their failed Liberal approach, Canada's Conservatives have a five-point plan to secure our future, including help for first-time home buyers. First-time home buyers know they're only going to get help when this Liberal government gets out of the way and the Conservatives come to get the job done. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is utterly hypocritical for the Conservatives to even pretend to be cons concerned about Canadians and the Canadian economy. The single biggest threat the Canadian economy faces today is Conservative partisanship, which is blocking our budget. Conservatives are blocking the extension of the wage subsidy, rent subsidy and income supports. Canada is ready to come roaring back, Mr. Speaker. We just need Conservatives to get out of the way. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Falsifying his service record, throwing Admiral Mark Norman under the bus, misleading Canadians. 
Do we want to hear more? Because the Liberal caucus seems to forget, Mr. Speaker. He bought used fighter jets. He cut benefits to our troops fighting ISIS. He cut health care for military members. He cut defense spending. He's all but eliminated Canadian peacekeeping. And of course, for three years, he covered up sexual misconduct allegations in the Canadian Armed Forces. The Canadian Armed Forces need leadership. When will this Prime Minister fire his Defence Minister? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we'll take no lessons uh, for, from the Conservatives when it comes to looking after our women and men in the Canadian Armed Forces. We know that we have a lot more work to do and we will get it done. And Mr. Speaker, it was their government that cut from defense with the strategic uh, review, the defense uh, reduction a action plan that they had, we as a party have put um, uh, over 70% increase into the defense budget, Mr. Speaker, and we have outlined it for 20 years. And we, have, we know that we have a lot more work to do to look after our Canadian Armed Forces members, and we will get it done. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will not do the honourable thing and resign after having failed women in the Canadian Armed Forces. The Prime Minister will not fire him. The Liberals are never accountable. Therefore, I want to speak directly to the voters in Vancouver South. If you want to end cover-ups on sexual misconduct in our military, if you want to secure accountability in Ottawa, it is going to be up to you to support the Conservatives in the next election to demand better and to replace the most corrupt and incompetent defence minister in Canada's history. It's up to you. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'll let my, uh, my actions uh, uh, be judged by the uh, by members of uh, Vancouver South, and I'm proud of my service. Mr. Speaker, but let's talk about the hypocrisy of the leader of the opposition. He leads a party that fails to protect a woman's right to choose, a party who amplified Islamophobia rhetoric when they were in government, who voted against a motion to condemn Islamophobia, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about a record, and we'll let the constituents of Vancouver South choose, and all Canadians to choose, and see their hypocrisy. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Government of Quebec is getting ready to modify the French language charter with, of course, the participation of the National Assembly of Quebec. Meanwhile, the federal government is tabling another intended bill on the Official Languages Act, which, of course, will never actually be passed. The federal bill is actually challenging and, and opposing uh, Quebec's bill. And when we point this out to the federal minister, she says she doesn't want to talk about this. She, she only wants to cooperate with us. But the problem is, who, which bill takes precedence, the federal one or the National Assembly of Quebec's bill when it comes to promoting and protecting the French language? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L listen, I want to reassure my colleague. This isn't just an intention. This is an actual bill, a bill that we will want to get passed. And we're asking all opposition parties, including the Bloc Quebecois, to support it. Do they want to further protect the French language in Quebec and across the country? Do they want to ensure that Francophones have access to linguistic security so that French will become sustainable uh, in the future in Quebec? No, it seems that they want to continue with their sovereigntist uh, rhetoric and uh, talk about Quebec becoming a country. The Honourable Member for Belle Champlain. Well, she's interested in a few things. The Bloc Québécois wants to better protect the French language in Quebec and wants to do so legitimately. And to do so, that has to go through the National Assembly of Quebec. So she doesn't need to count on our support for her bill, which would officialize bilingualism in this country. So my question is this, is she really claiming that her bill, which will never be passed, will, would better protect fr the French language than Quebecers would do themselves under the French language charter? The Honourable Minister, you know, that this is the Bloc Québécois. They're always looking for arguments, although our, well, our goal is to protect the French language. We want to protect my linguistic minorities all across the country. We have had one message for the whole country because that's how you ensure that federalism is strengthened and that opportunities uh, all across the country are, are protected. Under the circumstances, our goal will always be to defend the Official Languages Act, to strengthen it, and to modernize it. 
The Honorable Member for Burnaby South. The big banks have received billions of dollars in aid from this government, and they have made massive prof profits. And now they're increasing banking fees, and this government is just letting them do it. But for the nearly two million people who need the CRB to pay their rent, this government is going to be cutting assistance by $800 a month. This is a bad decision. Will the Prime Minister reverse his decision to cut assistance to families? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. If the budget bill is not passed, then these COVID supports will end, like the CRB, the wage subsidy, the rent subsidy, and so on. They won't be an available any longer. So if the NDP thinks that Canadians don't need this support, maybe they should be honest with them and say so. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. I want to put a forward a contrast for you. At least 68 companies, large corporations in Canada, received billions of dollars of support from this Liberal government and then turned around and paid out billions of dollars to their shareholders. This government's doing nothing about that, not going after them at all. But for the nearly 2 million Canadians who can't go back to work, who need to rely on the CRB to pay their rent, the government is going to cut their help by $800 a month. That's my question. Why is this government doing that? And will the Prime Minister reverse his decision to cut help to families in the middle of this pandemic? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, and my question to the leader of the NDP is why is he stopping our government from extending the CRB? We agree that Canadian workers need additional support over the summer as the Canadian economy comes roaring back. That's why our budget extends support to September 25th. If the NDP thinks that support is no longer necessary, they should be open and say that to Canadians. Otherwise, help us pass the budget and extend these necessary supports. Well, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, our Canadian Armed Forces is in chaos. The unraveling of the top brass and the repeat cycle of resignations is beyond disturbing. Who's actually in charge? It's clear the Defence Minister has lost all respect, and he and the Prime Minister are considered a joke because of their terrible leadership. The men and women in our military can't afford any more of this. So here's my question. Can the Minister tell us, did the Prime Minister ever, ever voice concerns to him about how he handled sexual misconduct in the Canadian Canadian Armed Forces. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government and myself are absolutely committed to making sure that we create an inclusive environment for the Canadian Armed Forces. Our, our resolve is just the same as when we came and formed government in 2015 as it is now. And I hope that the uh, uh, member opposite will support uh, Budget 2021, where we're adding $236 million where we are to, for eliminating sexual misconduct from the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Honourable the Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, I'll take that as a no, which means our military can just expect more of the same from this fake feminist government. Our military deserves a minister and a prime minister who don't just say the right words, but actually do the right thing. The respect and trust for this minister is gone. The damage to him is beyond repair. And when our military doesn't respect their top commander, we are in a very precarious place. Our armed forces and our country cannot afford this to continue. So will the minister Minister, do the right thing and finally resign. Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservatives continue with their political uh, cheap shots, we'll stay focused on the Canadian Armed Forces. While they're, uh, when they were in government, they cut from the Canadian Armed Forces budget. Mr. Speaker, we've added. We're at increasing the defence budget by 70%. We put people in first. Chapter number one is in about our people, focused on our people in defence policy. But we know that we have a lot more work to do to eliminate the, uh, any type of misconduct from the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, and we will double down and get it done. Thank you. 
the Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, he's doubling down on defending him, himself and his whole horrible failed record. The men and women in the Canadian Armed Forces do not respect this minister, and him continuing in this role is damaging our military. The minister has failed these people who defend us. Our troops have sacrificed so much, and it's time the minister did the right thing for these men and women. Conservatives have a five-point plan to secure Canada's future, and that includes bringing accountability, honour and respect back to our military. So again, I ask this minister, will he do the right thing? Will he step aside for the sake of our country and for our men and women in uniform? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that we have a lot more work to do, as I said, and we need to get the work done, and we and we will. But when it comes to honouring the sacrifice of our Canadian Armed Forces members, it's about supporting them, giving them the proper resources for them to do their work. And that's what our government has done in our defence policy. We've increased the budget by over 70% within 10 years, Mr. Speaker, guaranteed it for 20 years. We re-equipped all our services, not cut from the defence uh, budget like the previous government done so they could balance their budget. Thank you. L'honorable député de Ch The Honourable Member for Chique de Tumi de Fier. Mr. Speaker, enough is enough. It's time to send a message. The Minister of Defence has completely failed our military after years of incompetence. The Prime Minister himself has said that the problem of sexual misconduct in the military has gone unaddressed for far too long. But he's acting as, as if this didn't happen on his watch. If he really wants to change things, the Prime Minister needs to fire his Minister of Defence. Why is the Prime Minister stubbornly keeping him in his position? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I stated, I know that we have a lot more work to do when it comes to eradicating all forms of misconduct. We have started that us from the day one that we formed a government. We know that we have a lot more work to do, and I hope that the member opposite will support Budget 2020, uh, 2021 um, because it includes $236 million for eliminating sexual misconduct from the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi de Fier. Mr. Speaker, Canada is a country of honour. And our brave men and women who serve in our armed forces deserve all the support that we can give them. But every day that the defense minister remains in office shows a lack of respect for those who serve in our armed forces. The minister shouldn't be thinking of how he can put things right at this point. It's too late. He should, he should resign. When will the minister understand that? Honorable minister. Mr. Speaker, what our government understands is to making sure to support our women and men in the Canadian Armed Forces, we need to resource them properly. We need to put proper policies in place. As I stated before, we know that we have a lot more work to do given the recent allegations that we have seen, and we will get it done. We have appointed uh, uh, Justice Louise Arbor to making sure that we get the right recommendations on the how to, uh, to making sure that we eliminate all forms of sexual misconduct. We will get this done. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi de Fier. Mr. Speaker, the Liber Liberal government's time in office has turned into a cycle of scandals, followed by empty excuses and a false promise to do better. But we never see any real accountability. The situation in the military is a perfect example. It's become toxic and it's falling apart before our eyes. Either the Minister of Defence must resign or the Prime Minister must fire him. Which of the two will make the honourable choice? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to support the Canadian Armed Forces for what they need, not like the previous government where they cut from the defence budget just so they can try to balance their budget. We've increased the budget by 70%, but most, most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we put an emphasis on supporting our people. Uh, we have chapter number one, and if they read the defence policy, focuses on our people. We know that we have a lot more work to do when it comes to eliminating sexual misconduct or any form of misconduct from, from the Canadian Armed Forces, and we are going to get it done. Thank you. Honorable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, Quebec wants to protect the French language. If Ottawa was respecting its jurisdiction, it would protect French by simply letting the Quebec Charter of the French language apply to businesses under federal jurisdiction. Yet the minister is doing the opposite with Bill C-32. She's setting the stage for more bilingualism by extending the influence of Canada's Official Languages Act. She's creating a jurisdictional dispute instead of helping to stop the decline of French. Why does the minister refuse to do the right thing by letting Quebec simply enforce Bill 101? The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is referring to a dispute with Quebec. Maybe that's what she wants, but I don't think it really exists. This morning, I had a conversation with my colleague, uh, yesterday with uh, Ms. Labelle, and, you know, we agree because most uh, organizations in Quebec have already voluntarily subjected themselves to Bill 101, so of course we will give them the choice to continue to do that or to uh, be subject to the Official Languages Act. So we are just filling a jurisdictional void here. We want people to be able to have access to services in French in federally regulated organizations and have the right to work in French. The Honorable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, there's no jurisdictional uh, void here, and Quebec doesn't intend to rely on Bill C-32. Quebec's Minister of French has stated that one thing is certain, it's the terms and conditions of the Quebec Bill that will apply in Quebec. The federal minister has replied with a challenge. She said, we have jurisdiction over federal undertakings, so do they want to protect French or do they want to stubbornly resist? Clearly, the minister has chosen to be stubborn herself. Even though her bill doesn't protect French, it protects bilingualism. Why doesn't she let Quebec simply protect French with, with its own Bill 101? The Honourable Minister. Thank you. Listen, I have a lot of colleague, uh, respect for my colleagues, but I have to wonder if she's really read the bill, because the bill is clear. It recognizes the work, the right to work in French, to be served in French, and of course not to be discriminated uh, against because you are a, a francophone in Quebec. So that this is the first time that the uh, government has made a step in this direction. I think it was high time to do it, and we are proud of tabling this bill. It's a historic bill uh, that was tabled yesterday. Will the Bloc Québécois support it or not? For Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of National Defence has always had a casual relationship with the truth. He misled Canadians about the opposition of Iraqi officials for pulling our CF-18s out of the fight against ISIS. He embellished his service record, saying he was the architect of Operation Medusa. He originally denied he knew about the General Vance allegations in 2018, but was complicit in the cover-up for three years. Canadians don't trust this Minister of National Defence. Members of the military don't trust him. When will the Prime Minister fire him? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'll take no lessons from the, from the member opposite, who was the Parliamentary Secretary of, of, uh, of National Defence when they were in government, when they slashed the budget of defence at, at that time. Mr. Speaker, they didn't put the, put the troops first. They didn't uh, deal with the misconduct. Mr. Speaker, when we formed government, we made it very clear that we wanted to put our people first and to eliminate sexual misconduct or any form of misconduct from the Canadian Armed Forces. But we know from uh, recent allegations that we have a lot more work to do. We are willing to get it done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, this minister hasn't learned anything from his own mistakes, so he should actually follow our examples. The Canadian Armed Forces is losing senior officers at an alarming rate. Two Chiefs of Defence Staff are under investigation. The seventh Vice Chief of Defence Staff since 2015 just resigned. All of this is happening under the failed leadership of this Defence Minister and is creating a national security crisis for our nation. The Minister of Defence must be held to account, and no one trusts him to rebuild our armed forces. So will the Prime Minister fire his inept Defence Minister today? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to supporting our Canadian Armed Forces, you need to put your money where your mouth is. And that's exactly what our government did, not like the previous government, when the member, especially when he was part as a parliamentary secretary in national defence, we have invested in the Canadian Armed Forces. All our services will be re-equipped when it comes to, because we've increased the budget by uh, uh, 20%. We have put an emphasis on dealing with misconduct, uh, Mr. Speaker, something that we wish that we could have it done immediately. And we wish that we could have it done overnight, but we know that we have a lot more work to do and we're willing to get it done. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, Canadians were shocked to learn that the man with control over the sexual misconduct investigation went golfing with the man accused of the sexual misconduct, General Vance. Clearly, these men at the top of the Canadian military were not informed of the seriousness of this investigation, were not informed of the need for a culture change in our military. This Liberal government and this Defence Minister have had six years to fix this, and yet they resoundingly failed, or this golfing scandal would have never happened. How can the Minister take these questions with a straight face? Has he no honour, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, as I, as I stated uh, before, the acting chief of defense staff, defense staff is clear, uh, reviewing this matter very close, close, closely as it falls within his responsibility within the chain of command. And the acting chief of defense staff um, has already uh, uh, sta stated that uh, the vice chief of defense staff is currently no longer in his role. Our government has a lot more work to do when it comes to dealing with misconduct, and we will get it done. Thank you. Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has built his entire image on being a feminist, and yet after six years he has allowed this toxic culture to continue under the watch of his Defence Minister, who sat idly by and allowed the most powerful military men in our country to continue to demean and disrespect our women in uniform. What message does this send to the women and to men in this country, to aspiring women leaders in our military, that the Prime Minister thinks this is acceptable behaviour? Canadians are watching, Mr. Speaker, and will the Prime Minister be a leader for once and fire his defense minister. The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, when it comes to dealing with misconduct, we know that we have a lot more uh, work to do, and I hope that uh, the, the member opposite will support Budget 2021, where we have outlined $236 million to eliminate sexual misconduct from the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. The Honorable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister has defied Parliament and went back to court this week to try and quash the Human Rights Tribunal ruling. And his argument is, get this, that it's his government that is the party that was wronged here. Not the thousands of Indigenous children whose lives were destroyed in that system from, quote, willful and reckless discrimination. It's also false to claim that these are historic wrongs. This is happening today. We are losing an Indigenous child every three days, and yet this Prime Minister would rather fight children in court. When is he going to stop his toxic legal war against First Nation children? The Honourable Minister. Oh, Mr. Speaker, it's important for all Canadians and for the, indeed this entire House to know that there isn't a single Indigenous child that has been asked to testify as part of this process and as part of the class actions. That is our aim to keep it so. Any First Nations child that has been discriminated by the broken child welfare system will get fair, just and equitable compensation and we will move forward on that as precipitously as possible as well as affect systemic transformation so this does not occur again. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have spent over $20 million fighting the new town of people in court, denying their fishing rights. Last month, the courts reaffirmed the rights of these nations for the third time. The government has until Friday to appeal the court's decision. The last time I asked if the government would respect Indigenous fishers' rights and let them get back on the water to support their families, the fisheries minister said they were working with the new town. Let me be clear, taking them to court is not the same as working with them. Will the justice minister respect Indigenous Indigenous rights, call off the government lawyers and confirm that he will not appeal this ruling. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have worked very hard to make sure that we are able to make sure that uh, First Nations are able to exercise their right to fish as well as sell fish. Um, we are going to continue to work with the Nichalmuth First Nation to make sure that these rights are upheld. Uh, and I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question. I think we'll just stay quiet so we can hear the conversation that's going on between two, two very honourable members, just to make sure we're not missing anything. <laughs> Thank you. I think, are we done with our conversation? Good. We'll continue. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Canso. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that is committed to strengthening seniors' financial security and improving their quality of life. And I was happy to see our government fulfill its promise to increase the OAS benefit for Canadians later in life in Budget 2021. But we know seniors have other needs. Can the Minister tell the House and Canadians what we're doing to support some of the most vulnerable low-income seniors from coast to coast to coast? The Honourable Minister. I want to thank my colleague for his advocacy for seniors. While no solution can meet everyone's needs, step by step, we are making progress. For low-income seniors, we increased the GIS by 10% for singles and increased and enhanced the GIS earnings exemption. We lowered the age of eligibility for OAS and GIS to 65 from 67, and for future retirees, we enhanced the CPP by almost 50%. For everyone, we're increasing the basic personal amount, saving individuals close to $300 every year. Our government's work is making a real difference in the lives of seniors. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, today we learned that the cost of living in Canada is up, way, way up. 
Inflation is now at 3.6 percent, the highest it's been over 10 years. Prices for everything, gasoline, food, furniture, are up, 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 while millions of Canadians see their dream of home ownership disappear. Canadians need a leader who's focused on governing, not on preening for the cameras at the G7. When will the Prime Minister finally take his job seriously and make life more affordable for the people he's supposed to be serving? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is utterly hypocritical for the Conservatives to even pretend to be concerned about ordinary Canadians. The single biggest threat the Canadian economy faces today is Conservative partisanship, which is blocking our budget. Conservatives are blocking the extension of the wage subsidy, the extension of the rent subsidy, and the extension of income supports. Canada is ready to come roaring back, Mr. Speaker. We just need the Conservatives to get out of the way. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Mr. Speaker, even this finance minister doesn't get it. Inflation is way up. It's at its highest point in a decade, proving that the finance minister's trillion-dollar bet and endless deficits are inflicting more and more damage on our country. Meanwhile, the cost of everything is going up, and housing has become unaffordable for millions of families. How much more expensive does life have to get before this minister and her Liberal government realize how badly they have failed, exhausted Canadians. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what else Canadians who indeed are exhausted and who indeed do need support. Let me tell you what else they're being deprived of because of the immature partisan games of the Conservatives. $5 billion to support provincial and territorial health systems, $4 billion directly to the health care system, and $1 billion for the essential vaccination campaign. That is what Canadians need right now, Mr. Speaker, and it's what Conservatives are blocking. The Honourable Member for Carlton. So today it's clear we have an inflationary bubble. This government is just trying to pump even more hot air into that bubble. They have created a trillion dollar debt, which means too many dollars chasing too few goods and services. Now, in addition to not having paychecks, Canadians who do work are seeing their paychecks nibbled up by this growing level of inflation. Will this government reverse its inflationary policy, stop spending what it doesn't have, restore fiscal responsibility, and allow Canadians to afford their cost of living. Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what is truly irresponsible today, just as we are poised to finish the fight against COVID. What is irresponsible are conservative partisan games. Canadians need the wage subsidy. They need the rent subsidy, and they need income support to be extended to the end of September. But the Conservatives are stopping us from passing our budget, and it is that irresponsible behaviour which threatens the well-being of every single Canadian. The Honourable Member for Carleton. So she just wants us to help her give more and more inflationary spending into the economy, driving up the cost of living, particularly on the working poor, and devaluing the wages of the Canadian people. We have the second highest unemployment in the G7, higher than the OECD, higher than the UK, the US, Japan, and Germany. And now those same unemployed Canadians are facing higher prices for shelter, fuel, and food. Instead of ramming through another inflationary budget that drives up the cost of living, why won't she actually reverse course and protect the value of the dollars Canadians earn? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, the member opposite needs to get his numbers right. Canada's labour force participation rate in April was, in fact, higher than the labour force participation rate in the US, in the UK, in France, and in Italy. But, Mr. Speaker, I do want all members of this House to help me and to help our government support Canadians. I want them to help me extend the business and income supports. I want them to help me give more support to our seniors and to our youth. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. 
Mr. Speaker, C-32 invalidates Quebec's Bill 96 and its efforts to apply Bill 101 to federally regulated businesses. C-32 doesn't make French the language of the workplace. It just tolerates workers speaking French. It doesn't recognize French as the only official language of Quebec and does nothing to counter its threatened minority status. So C-32 prevents Quebec from controlling its own language policy, and why would Quebec support that rather than its own Bill 101, the Honourable Minister? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We should stop uh, fear-mongering. Look, C-32, which is the Act to Modernize the Official Languages Act, which was tabled yesterday, makes federally regulated businesses required to allow workers to work in French, to serve customers in French. Basically, there are the same provisions as in Bill 101, adapted to a national system which applies both in Quebec and in areas outside Quebec with a heavy francophone presence. Many employers already comply with this, but for those, uh, there will be no longer a legal vacuum for the others. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, Quebec wants Bill 101 to cover businesses under federal, federal jurisdiction. It's simple. It's all about applying the existing law. And the Bloc has a bill that does just that. We don't need a government bill plopped down six days before the end of the session that will never be debated or voted on. Our bill will be put to a vote in half an hour. It's as simple as that. So, will the minister be voting with us to enforce Bill 101 in Quebec? The Honourable Minister. I remember the debates I had with my colleague when he constantly was asking me to strengthen the Official Languages Act and to recognize the unique situation of French in Quebec so that federally regulated businesses would be required to uh, provide for a uh, French-speaking workplace and to serve customers in French. So it's all been done. It's all there in our bill. And the question is, will he support our bill? Will the Bloc support new measures in the Official Languages Act? Milton Hills. Mr. Speaker, there's no reason why the government can't answer the following question. President Biden directed U.S. intelligence to determine whether the pandemic originated from human contact with an animal or from a lab accident at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Last weekend, the G7 discussed this issue and the government pledged cooperation. Given that government scientists at the Canadian lab in Winnipeg work closely with the Wuhan lab, will these scientists and their documents, including lab notes, be made available to U.S. investigators? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, we support uh, the call by President Biden to get to the bottom of this issue. It is so important that after the world has been turned upside down by the COVID pandemic and that over 3 million people have died, that we try our very best to understand what caused this pandemic. And for that reason, using the best available science, we should do exactly that, try to figure out where this all started from. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know from public documents and peer-reviewed academic papers that a Chinese military scientist, Fei Yu Yen, of the People's Liberation Army worked at the Winnipeg Lab, a level four facility where the world's most dangerous viruses and pathogens are handled. Who approved this individual to work at the government's lab in Winnipeg? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. S uh, Speaker, the National Microbiology Lab is a secure facility and everyone working at and visiting the lab must undergo security screening and adhere to the strictest protocols, procedures and policies. This is very important to not only the lab, but to uh, Canada and to Canadians. And so I want to thank the lab during Public Service Week for their incredible work to helping Canadians through COVID-19. Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the minister didn't answer my question. I'll try another. During this pandemic, the health minister has been telling Canadians to follow public health orders. 
yet the health minister continues to defy a house order to hand over documents about the Winnipeg lab. Does the minister not see how corrosive this is to the rule of law when she tells Canadians to comply with public health orders while at the same time defying an order of this house? The Honourable Minister. Well, that's quite a piece of conflation, Mr. Speaker. What I will say is that I have fully shared uh, through the Public Health Agency of Canada and through the President Ian Stewart, fully unredacted documents to a committee of all parliamentarians for the review. And so, in fact, those documents are available for review in a way that does not compromise privacy or national security issues. The Honourable Member for Chateauguay Lacolle. Mr. Speaker, Business women all across Canada have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Women have been forced out of the workforce to care for their children due to the pandemic. And we've seen them take longer to get back into the workforce. Budget 2021 makes a generational investment in an early learning and childcare system that will enable women to get back to work. Could the minister talk about other measures in Budget 2021 to support women entrepreneurs? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my Honourable colleague for this very important question. We know the pandemic has revealed critical problems with our social safety net, especially issues facing women entrepreneurs. I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight this government's transformational investment in Budget 2021. And this increased funding will not only allow women to get back to work, but it'll build a stronger economy. I'd like to highlight the proposed investment to bolster the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy. This will give women entrepreneurs the mentoring, training, and financing they need to make their businesses thrive. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, this week the Minister of Health graced us with her presence at committee to answer questions, but she wasted our time for three hours. She said the same non answers and platitudes that she gives in question period. She even went so far as to suggest she hadn't been briefed on this security breach at the Winnipeg lab. So can the Prime Minister confirm that his Minister of Health really wasn't briefed on this? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I see the member opposite is putting words in my mouth. And in fact, I spent three hours at committee. It was approximately my 26th appearance in front of the House uh, committees this season. And I will say, Mr. Speaker, that I was fully transparent with the committee. And I reminded the committee that the fully unredacted documents are with NSI COP, a committee of parliamentarians that has the appropriate clearance to review those documents. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. I'd encourage the minister to consult the blues of the committee because it was clear she said she didn't know anything, she never knew anything. Our questions about the Winnipeg lab are legit, but the prime minister accuses us of, ra uh, accuses us of racism and fear-mongering. However, at G7 meetings last week, the same prime minister support supported a motion that called China a threat to public safety and a government trying to undermine the global system. The prime minister acts all brave on the world stage but won't answer our questions. Why not? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, I spent three hours at the committee answering questions from parliamentarians and repeatedly referring uh, the parliamentarians to the statement of the president of the um, Public Health Agency of Canada, who has uh, submitted all the documents unredacted to the appropriate committee of parliamentarians that can review those documents. No, no, the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the fact is when the Prime Minister says protecting public safety is the reason he's keeping the truth from Canadians, the real problem, though, is that if this information were made public, it would show how the Prime Minister got played by China, and it wouldn't be the first time. We all remember how he was had when he tried to collaborate on vaccine development. 
And that's why the Prime Minister doesn't wants us not to know what happened. Can he at least confirm that all research cooperation with China has been called off? There was an interruption. So I would ask the member for, for Charles Labour to repeat his question, please, so that we can hear it. And I'd also like to remind all members who are joining us uh, virtually to ensure that their microphones are on mute. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister keeps saying protecting public safety is the reason he's keeping the truth from Canadians about the major security breach at the Winnipeg lab. But the truth is that if this information were made public, it would show how he got played by the Chinese regime. And it wouldn't be the first time we all remember how he was had when he tried to collaborate on vaccine development. Can the Prime Minister at least confirm that all research cooperation with Chi Chinese scientists has been called off? The Honourable Minister. Yet again, Mr. Speaker, we see the Conservative Party playing really dangerous games with national security, and we will never do that on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We understand that there's an appropriate way to release documents in a way that protects their privacy and their national security aspects, and those documents have been released in a fully unredacted fashion to a committee of parliamentarians who have the appropriate clearance to do those reviews. The Honourable, Mem the Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, climate change is the existential issue of our time, and Canadians across this country want to see their governments take action to address it. More than ever, the environment and the economy have to go hand in hand to offer our children and grandchildren a healthy environment and one in which they can thrive. So could the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity and Associate Minister of Finance please update this House on the investments we're making to grow the economy and protect the environment? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member of Etobicoke Centre for his important question. We are taking action to fight climate change and grow our economy. Our investments in Budget 2021 are a critical step forward because on this side of the House, we know that climate change is real. Budget 2021 represents $7.6 billion that will help build a cleaner and more sustainable future, which builds on $50 billion from our strengthened climate plan and also another 15 billion investment in public transit. This includes to help restore wetlands and rehabilitate stormwater systems and also in interest-free loans of up to $40,000 for home retrofits. Mr. Speaker, we are... The Honourable Member for Churchill, Kiwatnu Aski. Mr. Speaker, following the 215 children found buried in Kamloops, First Nations are calling for action. But this government is MIA. Pimichikamak Cree Nation calls for the International Commission on Missing Persons to come in. This government sends them a form letter. First Nations ask for help to search for mass graves. This government recycles an insulting 2019 funding announcement. And now we have news that SNC-Lavalin is filling in while the government neglects its responsibilities. Mr. Speaker, this is genocide. First Nations and experts are calling for an independent Commission and international experts concrete action. When will the Prime Minister listen and act? Honourable Minister. All Canadians were heartbroken when we learned of the remains of the children of the former Kamloops Residential School. We are working with the community and our partners, such as the BC First Nations Health Authority, to provide all the resources and the supports needed as determined by the community and all communities. We are also reaching out to Indigenous communities across Canada on how to best support them in finding their lost children and healing, including how they can access the $27 million of funding being made available right now on an urgent basis.